patient-derived xenograft models. Um, essentially what these are are models that um, are derived from the primary tumor from a patient that either has primary disease or metastatic disease. Uh, these are removed at the time of surgery and then they're implanted into immunodeficient mice. The idea behind them is rather than being established from cell lines or cultures of cell lines, they're actually derived from the patient's tumor. So what's interesting about the models is that essentially they do not reside on plastic at any point in their creation, um, making them much more uh, similar to the patient tumor. In terms of the different types of xenotransplantation, for patient-derived xenografts, we normally think of whether or not the tumor is going to be implanted subcutaneously, similar to what we do with cell lines, or whether or not we're going to do an orthotopic transplantation. And so that would be one where we would try to recapitulate uh, where the primary tumor resides in the mouse. For instance, um, implanting a breast tumor into a mammary fat pad. Um, uh, sometimes kidney cancers will be implanted into the subrenal capsule. So I would say overall the two most common time, types are either orthotopic or um, sort of subcutaneous transplantation. So the strengths of patient-derived xenograft models, which I'll call PDX models, are that uh, they are much closer in terms of the time of the origin of uh, being removed from the patient. So we think the strengths relate to the fact that they're closer to the age of when they came from the patient. Um, the fact that they haven't been on plastic before is a huge strength because cell lines really undergo a lot of changes when they're um, put into plastic. And I would say one of the other major strengths is the fact that they resemble the genetics of the tumor from the patient. The weaknesses of PDX models, um, if you think about it, are pretty obvious. One is, if we're interested in immunotherapy, since we're putting these uh, tumors back into immunodeficient mice, then clearly we're not able to really test adequately immunotherapies. Probably the other second major weakness has to do with the fact that over time, the human um, microvasculature and stroma is eventually replaced by the mouse. So again, this causes some difficulties when we're looking at treatments that target the microvasculature or the stroma. In terms of how we're using PDX models for drug development, my own personal view is that I'm not convinced that they will be more predictive in terms of um, determining whether or not a drug will eventually work in a patient. Where they will be more useful is in really doing what I consider near clinical testing, where let's say for instance we have a genetic fingerprint of how we think a drug should work, then I think before taking it into patient trials, we can actually test that hypothesis in these PDX models. Um, so in my view, one of their main uses is going to be in testing genetic hypotheses to predict whether or not a patient will, will respond. One of the most important questions is, uh, in which types of tumors are these models uh, credentialed. And we think that in fact um, that really has not been completed yet. Uh, what that would require is a lot of testing um, where you would basically compare how a patient responded to how the mouse responds. And probably some of the most extensive studying has been done in colorectal cancer uh, where the Italian group, Andrea Bertotti and all, have been able to demonstrate that colorectal tumors in these PDX models in many ways do recapitulate what we see in the patients. Thank you.